Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. A real pleasure to have you here with us at Sundance London. Thank Maybe you, Sarah. You could begin... Pleasure to be here. Thank you for taking the time. Maybe you could start by introducing yourselves and also introducing the film. What can people expect when they watch Skywalker's A Love Story? My name is Maria Bucanina. I'm a producer and co-director of the film. Hi, I'm Jeff Zimbalist. I am the director, producer, one of the editors on the film. And Tamir Adon, one of the producers on the film. Skywalker tells the story of a Russian couple who trespasses onto the highest buildings in the world and takes um, amazing photography and drone art of uh, their acrobatic stunts. And uh, we like to say that it's a film less about the fear of falling from heights and more about the fear of falling in love. Where did it all begin? I mean, it's quite niche sort of activity. People might know it a lot from social media and the like, but how did you first come across it? and? What was the motivation to want to make a film about it? I thought I had discovered uh, this activity. I, I just called it trespassing. But when I was a teenager and I was going up on roofs and sneaking into subway tunnels underneath the city, um, it felt novel. It was a way to face my fears on my own terms and figure out who I wanted to be in the world on my own terms. Um, it wasn't until I started telling stories and became a journalist that I realized, actually, no, Jeff, this has a name and is a rising phenomena around the world. And many people do it. And it's called rooftopping. Uh, and I said, well, I have to make a, a film in that space. And it's got to resonate as deeply as my experiences did for me in my formative years. And it took 15 years to find a story worthy of a feature length documentary. Um, Angela Nicolau, who was the first female rooftopper, burst on the scene in around 2015, 2016. And she had her own style. Um, she said she wasn't going to compete with the guys because she was bringing a feminine lens to it and really doing her own thing. Um, I reached out to her and she was raised as a gymnast uh, by a family who was in the circus. I thought that was fascinating. And then she introduced me to Ivan Birkis, who was the best rooftopper in Russia at the time. And uh, they talked about each other as rivals and competitors, but you could tell that bubbling under the surface was a courtship. And that was when the idea um, for this being a love story, that seed was planted, that maybe we could tell a love story on top of the world and use um, extreme climbing as a metaphor for romantic trust. At that point, Tamir and XYZ Films and Library Films, who I'd known for many years, got on board and took a leap of faith financing the project, allowed us to hire Maria and the rest of the team. And it was six years in the making across six different countries. In terms of bringing your subject on board, you know, was that any kind of negotiation or, or process? Was it something they jumped at the idea of? Because of course, you know, it's, it is an intense and, and process and something that they have to be very open to, to, to sort of open their, their lives up to the camera. I think when they got into the project with us, they probably didn't fully realize what it takes to make a feature doc and how much we wanted to be around them with cameras and how deep we wanted to get into their lives. Um, you know, they're Instagram stars, so they're very used to curating and editing their own image and presenting a picture perfect still moment, uh, you know, a moment in time and not showing all the ups and downs and the disagreements and financial difficulties and romantic difficulties to the camera and to the public. We uh, originally they signed up because they were very excited about Jeff's pedigree. He's a veteran filmmaker. He's been very successful with his feature docs. So they bought into the idea that we will make a film about them. But, you know, they're digital and native generation. They're young people that didn't really think we would do it for this long and this deep. So it took us a bit. We had to teach them that we want all the things about their lives that what they usually used to leave behind the camera and not show people. Um, so trust was a thing we had to develop together. And, you know, we like to say that after all these years together, they taught us to how to rooftop and we taught them how to make a feature film. And that's why you get to see on camera all these intimate moments between them, because at some point they forgot the camera was there because we just spent all the time together for years. And logistically, a stupid question, but how much were you sending cameras up with them? How much were you going along with them on their adventures? Um, how much were you, you know, in their homes, getting with them on trains and things, you know, to, to what kind of 
were they self-shooting and, and to what extent were you were you guys shooting them? Uh, the first act of the film, the first 30 minutes, is primarily archival footage that they shot themselves or that other filmmakers filmed with them. Um, they gave us over 80 hours of their own footage when we started the project. We shot another 200 plus hours of Verite follow doc footage, um, most of which was not on buildings, but we would climb to the roofs of buildings where it was rather safe. We did do some trespassing with them. We had a safety protocol an agreement with their families, um, their, their parents and their siblings, that we wouldn't go up on spires or on cranes with them. So where the really hairy climbing uh, is going on in the film, they're filming that themselves. So they did their own drone work, selfie stick, GoPros, body cams, and then the climactic climb, um, which makes up the most of the third act, uh, they did without us as well. So they broke into the world's second highest building and made an attempt on that. Um, so we credit them as the extreme cinematographers in the film and we were lucky that uh, Ivan is an incredible drone artist and Angela really picked up the story component and making sure that the camera was running even when they were um, in their most awkward um, and often unflattering selves. I don't know if you guys have any kind of vertigo, I do a bit. I used to do climbing, but with a rope. Um, and watching this, you know, on the big screen really is quite terrifying. I mean, even whether you're watching them do it, whether you're watching their footage, um, did you have a lot of moments like that? Did you, did you, did it become normal to you? Did you get used to it? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think when it comes to putting stuff out there you want to allow people to experience something that they wouldn't normally experience on a daily basis which is why i think a lot of people are going to be drawn in to want to see this and when you see people watching this in the theater they're squirming in their seats they're covering their eyes i mean it's it's really bringing something out that nobody a lot of people don't even know this world exists for people doing this i think you know part of the reason we were so attracted when jeff came to us with the project was this notion of just exploring a world nobody knows exists that everyone should know exists and doing it in a way that's super visceral super exciting um, but also is grounded in a very universal story that people could be drawn into. And it's not just a spectacle of, you know, the best of crazy shots, but it's, it's a combination of all those things. But yeah, it's not something you get used to. And what's really cool is we're doing a, a one week IMAX run of the film before it comes out on Netflix. And so for the people that really want to experience the, the epic scale of it, they'll have that opportunity to do that on a, the largest screen available. I don't know if I could cope with seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to see it. <laughs> and I mean, do you know what? It also brought to mind watching Free Solo. And I remember speaking to the directors of that film of, did you ever feel that, um, you know, you didn't almost want to be there when something did go wrong, but you also want to capture it, and it's obviously something they're deciding to do themselves. Was there ever that kind of conflicted moment? Yeah, that was uh, our biggest concern going into this, was that our subjects were going to take more risk for the film or because they were being filmed than they would otherwise. And so we made it very clear to them up front and had an agreement and then continued to have the conversation where, you know, ethically it wasn't okay for them to push themselves any further than they would if we weren't there. Um, but yeah, that was a, a major part of our dynamic with them is to gauge how much we trusted their instincts because um, we're just as responsible if something happens to them when we're not there. As long as we're making a project with them, we're collaborators, we became friends. And so we often felt that they were being a little too reckless and had to have a conversation about them bringing it back down to earth. Angela uses the uh, metaphor of the, the flyer and the catcher from trapeze in the film. And so one leads you to the skies and the other brings you back down to earth. And often we felt like we were the, the catcher. There were times where they were the catcher and they said to us, you guys are getting a little unrealistic with your hopes and dreams here. And so they brought us back down to earth. And that was the beauty of the relationship and the trust that Maria played a, a, a central role in creating was that we could have these conversations, um, you know, responsible parties, all of us, and really weigh in on what we thought the dangers were and then come to a consensus. Were there moments along the way, there was there a particular moment that you felt very nervous or uncomfortable? And on the flip side, watching it back now, do you have a real favorite moment? 
There's a moment in the film when they're fighting while hanging off of a very high rusty spire. Um, we we weren't there with them, but they told it because they were, there's no room. There's the only room on the spire for two people, and they barely fit. And they had a creative disagreement, so they were had a fight, and then they came down to where we were on the rooftop, and they told us about it. And I was like, I mean, it's bad enough you guys go up there and do this crazy photography, but to fight, you know, as a boyfriend and girlfriend fighting on the, on this incredibly high and dangerous point was something that it took a little getting used to. But um, the whole, everything they do is potentially risky and potentially dangerous. And the final, you know, their big climb, the big heist that they prepared for was incredibly risky on several um, levels. You know, it's a government building. We're in Asia. The laws are very strict. So you kind of had to just go all in with them and say, we're going to do this, all of it together. And whatever it happens, happens to all of us together. And we're responsible for each other. And that worked. What I found fascinating about uh, the film as well is that like you say, it's not just about rooftoping, it's also a love story, but it also sort of, interestingly, then also delves into this idea of social media. I mean, when they're talking about, you know, oh, I started getting all these likes, I felt like a superstar, and then suddenly, you know, the pandemic happens, and then you get dropped by your sponsors, and it's kind of peeking behind the curtain of that world, which is obviously not just in kind of adrenaline junkie um, type activities, but goes, you know, whether you're just a, uh, a reality star or ex things like that. So was that also a really fascinating layer to explore about, you know, how we do raise people up and what can seem actually quite a false or superficial way, and then they can just be dropped again so easily? Yeah, that was a conversation we had a lot early in the project was, you know, is the world at large going to root for social media content creators? Um, are these sympathetic characters that we can identify with? It was important to us that we presented them as artists as well, not ignore the fact that a lot of their early success financially was coming from their followers on social media, but also point to the amount of the process that they do that genuinely has to do with their passion for creating and telling stories visually. Of course, when the pandemic hit, they lost their social media uh, followers and also sponsors, and so they had to find a new career. So that then freed us from this dynamic of of, you know, how are we going to present influencers to a world that doesn't always love influencers? Now they were actually artists trying to make ends meet um, and had really difficult decisions to make about their lives, including whether they were going to leave their families in Russia, maybe to never see them again. And so it, it just naturally evolved to a place where the types of career decisions they were making became no different from the types of conflicts and resolutions that we all engage with when we make career transitions. So we were, we were granted um, an unbelievable palette of um, their lives evolving to work with. And I'm really grateful to our finance team for letting us have the time to do that because it's rare to make a project over the course of seven years um, and to wait for the story to take form. And I, I think that's what allowed it to become um, as big scope a project as we've ended up with. And we're really grateful. And in terms of what people can take away from watching the film, when I guess it is opening people's eyes to this world that exists, you know, making people squirm because they feel nervous, but also, you know, feeling very connected and involved in, in this love story, as you, as you said at the beginning. Yeah, I think it, at the heart of the film is about trusting others, um, especially when it's the scariest thing to do and um, have coming off myself of many projects where our subjects were uh, morally compromised or actually criminals. Um, you know, there are so many stories out there that reinforce our fear of trusting others because there's betrayal and abandonment and deceit around every corner. Uh, but I think especially when it's the scariest thing to do, what we need is for people to unite across our differences and lean in just a little bit more to trusting each other. And the feedback on the film um, has been really rewarding because we'll, we'll see audience members come up to us after the screening and say, sure, sure, the vertigo is incredible and I love that my stomach dropped, but really, I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell my uh, the father of my child that I trust him now and that I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to trusting him so we could be good parents to our kid and then crying and giving us hugs and you know that the story of the, of the love and trust comes to the surface and ultimately is what resonates the most is a dream come true for us. And when you showed it to your subjects, what was their reaction? Um, 
the funny thing is we tried to show them some doc, feature docs before, just comparative, some just reference films for them to kind of understand how the format works. And they're like, we're not the generation that's going to sit through a 90-minute film. Sorry, guys, we're like into TikToks. So it took us several tries to like get through one film we wanted them to see. So this was the first time I think they watched a, an hour and a half film that, and they were completely captivated by it. And I think they, they loved that there was true to their story. They loved that there was showed warts and all, but it kind of um, emphasized their artistic vision as well and their um, unwillingness to compromise their vision uh, against what the world expects of them. I, I don't think they get enough credit for that or nobody ever talks about it. People don't really know the story. They loved it and they loved the attention. You know, we showed it in Sundance and people would stop us in the parking lots and on the streets just walking around and people would hang out of their car windows and yell, say, we saw your film, it's amazing. And also the kind of people who reacted to it was of such a diverse range that we didn't expect. There were people would come up to us and um, they wanted their autographs and they were in their 70s, you know, they were retirees. And then there were teenagers would come up, fathers and sons to get autographs. And little girls, so there was an eight-year-old girl with mom who chased us down the street because she was so captivated by Angela. So to see that kind of reaction from a wide variety of people, I think was very gratifying for them because being Instagram stars of us, especially a woman like her, you kind of get a, a mix of adoration and hate. People like to tell you, you shouldn't be doing this and why are you doing this? And you should be a mother instead. So there's always like a very black and white message online, but in real life, they got to see a reaction of a a regular person, but also all ages and all genders, which was very gratifying for them, I think. And what has it meant to you to have it in Sundance, now here in London, obviously Netflix as well? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge honor. Sundance is obviously just a premier film festival. Um, to have it premiere there and have that be our launch to be able to find the right home for it was, was key. Um, and that's really set the dominoes in place for where we're at uh, now um, and then being invited to Sundance Mexico Sundance London just continues to sort of uh, you know bring excitement uh, from our end in terms of bringing it to audiences around the world uh, and we're just really excited about ramping up for the the overall release this summer I felt that this was a huge risk um, from the onset it, it doesn't have it didn't at that time have obvious comparative films um, it felt like a real harebrained idea that came out of my personal uh, explorations as a teenager and I wasn't sure how that gets packaged to reach an audience. So to flash forward um, seven years and be at a place where we have the biggest distributors in the world bringing it to the biggest audiences in the world, it's unbelievable. Uh, it, it was Maria said in the last interview that some of this felt surreal, like she was watching somebody else's story as a filmmaker. And um, it was just our dream from the beginning to get it to this place. And so to be here is totally fulfilling. And what's going to be next? I mean, you said you took 15 years to finally nail this idea. What's Check in with us in 2037. <laughs> we'll have Skywalker's A War Story. <laughs> do you know Do you know what you're going to do next? Do you already have a uh, We're talking about a number of projects, including some other Skywalker stories. Um, so more to come. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with me. I really enjoyed presenting the film here in Sundance, London. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.